Today we are speaking with Daniel DiMartino Booth, the CEO and founder of Quill Intelligence, former Federal Reserve Insider expert and author of the book Fed Up. Daniel, welcome and thanks so much for your time. It's great to be here today. Thank you for taking the time to visit with me. Thank you. The pleasure is all mine. Would you be so kind and give us a brief background about you and your career? So uh, I, I left for the bright lights in the big city of, of Wall Street uh, when I got my MBA in finance. And I joined a firm called Donaldson, Lufkin and Genrette, extremely entrepreneurial, the first investment bank founded in the post-war period in New York. We ended up getting bought out by Credit Suisse, which was not near as much fun uh, in terms of the entrepreneurial aspect of the organization. I had actually been attending Columbia University at night where I got my second master's in journalism. So I signed a non-compete. I left Wall Street shortly after 9-11 and I retired to become a writer about the financial markets. Uh, but within a matter of months, the likes of Warren Buffett was on the phone with me and what are you writing about in the housing bubble and mortgaging the treasuries of the United States off to other countries. And so he invited me out to Omaha and that was a great pleasure. And in, in time, the predictions that I was making about the housing market got the attention of a certain Richard Fisher, who had just started as president of the Dallas Federal Reserve. Like Richard, I was, I was not a PhD in economics, neither was he. He also started off in New York on Wall Street. And we had similar ways of viewing the world, not just through pure economic models, but also through the financial markets and how they intersect with monetary policy and economic data. So when Richard retired, I ended up starting my own research firm, Quill Intelligence, which takes us where we are to today. I've got a great, great number of, of institutional and retail clients who rely on our research day in and day out. Before we dive into the Fed issues, um, I would like to hear your views on the political situation uh, with the US Senate control taken over by the Democrats. What is your take on the possible consequences in terms of economic policies? So, you know, there's no understating the fact that this is a huge game changer. And, you know, until, un until President Trump came out the weekend before the elections and called the elections illegal and invalid, and then suggested that his followers, his base in Georgia, vote negative, in other words, vote against the Republican ticket, Everything, all of my contacts and all of the Vegas, forget the polls, polls are, polls are not very good these days, but most everything suggested that the Republicans were going to stay in the hands of uh, the, the, the two uh, Georgia Senate seats were going to stay in the hands of the Republicans. That obviously did not happen. And the ramifications for tax policy. You know, we just had a recent survey out of small businesses, the largest small business survey in America. And throughout the last 12 to 18 months, even pre-pandemic, the greatest concern has been a lack of demand. And they're concerned that their revenue was going to, to, be, to be hit. And certainly that was the case post-pandemic. But fast forward to the aftermath of the blue sweep of Congress, and immediately it, it rises up. Their number one concern is now rising taxes. So we have to bear in mind that that President Biden can come in on day one and also take out his pen and reverse a lot of the regulatory red tape cutting that was accomplished with Trump over the past four years that he must be given credit for. So there's a lot of anxiety right now in the small and medium business sector, all the way up to corporate America to say nothing of investors because of the potential for rising capital gains taxes. And then there is the specter of gridlock being released such that you know it took them eight months last time to come up with a $908 billion package. And now we sit there biting our fingernails saying, are they gonna pop up with two or $3 trillion before the end of January? And what the ramifications might be in terms of the future for rising interest rates, the future for rising inflation, as well as throwing good money after bad to non-productive means that get us very little. So you know, the hope is that there are several moderates that remain independent voters, moderate Democrats, moderate uh, re Republicans, who are going to prevent just a wholesale unleashing of fiscal spending, but it really remains to be seen. What is your take on uh, the incoming Biden administration setup? There seem to be some interesting choices made in terms of the economic positions. 
Well, certainly the most interesting of those positions, uh, which would be a focal point for me because Janet Yellen was one of the, the, the starring characters in Fed Up, uh, but it was, uh, it's a matter of public record. The day her her name was announced, I was very much on Twitter and very much upset. And you know, the, the, what bothers me is that with Secretary of Treasury Mnuchin and Jay Powell, you've had Treasury and the Federal Reserve come more close together than they've ever been since the 1951 accord that separated them out. By design, they're supposed to be separate from one another, apolitical, independent. Now we have Treasury and the Fed closer than they've been in a half century, and somebody who used to work at the Fed coming in to run the Treasury Department, meaning the risk is that there, there be an even more incestuous relationship bet between the two institutions. And certainly that raises the specter of, as she has made in public remarks as recently as, as nine months ago, under the right circumstances, the Fed should be able to buy stocks. And she's made, you know, for years, she has said also, under the right circumstances, the Fed should be able to impose negative interest rates. You know, my greatest concern is that the rest of the world can possibly dole out negative interest rates. We're seeing the Bank of England move in that direction. Obviously, we've seen what's happened with the European Central Bank and Bank of Japan now. But there has to be one country that holds the line and maintains positive nominal interest rates or as the Bank of England's recent research itself has shown, you end up with financial models being broken. And in addition to that, if you look at who will be potentially second in command under Yellen at Treasury, it's another former Fed official who was focused on regulatory financial stability. I don't have a problem with making sure that, that there is more financial stability, but that actually means a lesser role for the central bank, not a bigger one. So the implication is going to be that the regulatory regime for the, for the financial system is also going to be dramatically impacted, which is, is not going to be friendly to the business environment in the United States. What do you think about the three BlackRock executives like Mike Pyle as a chief economic advisor to uh, Kamala Harris, Brian Dees as the head of uh, National Economic Council, Adewale Adeyemo as uh, Mrs. Yellen's deputy? So, uh, you know, you look at these things and you say, well, history never repeats itself, but it always rhymes. And that is certainly the question, that is certainly the, the circumstances that we see today. If the two of us were to be having this discussion a decade ago, you know, we might be lamenting the fact that Goldman Sachs was too cozy within the administration, that there were too many positions that Goldman Sachs, which was kind of the leading bank at the time. We've seen BlackRock rise up quickly and BlackRock has effectively been, been recruited by the Federal Reserve to, to assist it in monetary policy and executing a lot of these credit facilities. So you say to yourself, if I can see it in black and white, I can see the conflict of interest. Why are we going down this path again? And you know, I, I'd like to point out that if there's one thing that we've learned in recent weeks, it's the importance of social media and the ability to get messaging out. A, a decade ago, 12 years ago, when the financial crisis was coming, there wasn't the same amount of scrutiny on the treasury and on the central bank and on the coziness of that relationship. People in the business talked about it, certainly, but now it's going to be something that blows up on Twitter overnight. So there's, I think there's a little bit less in the way of, 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 of wiggle room that the public is willing to give because they're aware of these conflicts. They're aware of how embedded one institution is in the other and the problems that that can introduce. Uh, it seems like we have a mix of labor economists and financial industry incumbents. Uh, is this a continuation of bad news for American industry and service providers? Well, you know, we're going to see, you know, if, if there's any, if, if there's any potential for there to be a minimum wage imposed at a federal level, uh, don't get me wrong, corporate America has been collecting way over its weight for years now in terms of being very greedy at the expense of its employees, but the way pendulums work, they can always swing too far to the other side, and that would clearly be the concern, um, but but you, you do have to wonder about the the, the, the fact that there has been a monopolization, there has been an oligopolization of the economy in the United States, which has largely been an outgrowth of the fact that a lot of these gigantic companies are great for Wall Street. So if you see a competitor coming your way and you're, you're, you're 
your grandfather Google or your mother Microsoft, you just absorb them. And, but along the way, competition tends to get dis destructive. And that is what we're seeing. And we certainly don't want to see more of that. We don't want to see the bigger banks continue to be too big to fail, but even bigger than they were before. But given the mix of policymakers and advisors, Wall Street, Federal Reserve, Treasury, you could certainly paint uh, you know, a blueprint to where you got to a situation that was even worse than what it is today. In terms of economic policies coming from Biden administration, what is in your view likely to continue and what accelerate and pivot? So I would think that, that, that the, the coronavirus policy is going to be very much more um, proactive. You know, he's, I think Biden is saying he wants everybody to wear a mask. Our, our national leader clearly never said that and that caused tremendous tremendous frictions and issues and challenges uh, when the pandemic first hit. But I can see you know, more money going towards relieving the coronavirus. I could, but there's also by the same token, the, pop, the, the, the potential for there to be much higher taxes as well. And, a, and an immediate shift, an immediate reversal of so many of the things that were accomplished with, with Trump signing an executive order. So I would see the United States as reversing much of its policies when it comes to climate change in very, very short order. But again, that is maybe one thing that we can look at and say, okay, that's not gonna do damage, but the United States became a better place in which to conduct business under Trump which is something that is undeniable. And you don't wanna see a reversal of that because of what has already happened in the small and medium business sector and how difficult it is to be an entrepreneur in a post pandemic era. You certainly want, you wouldn't want to introduce red tape and make it that much more difficult or to your prior question, we're just gonna end up with bigger banks and bigger monopolies. Going back to your years at the Fed of Dallas, what were those like? And what, what made you write the, the, the book Fed Up, actually, a subtitled Why the Fed is Bad for America? So I was never, uh, I, I was never well suited to be a bureaucrat. And so it was a very uncomfortable nine years for me inside the Federal Reserve. Uh, but I did feel as if I was, uh, I, I was serving my country. I had identified the housing bubble and I had a lot of ideas as to how that could be addressed. Uh, QE2 and QE3 were not at the top of my list to be sure. Uh, but what got me to write Fed Up? What, you know, I had four young children at the, at the time. What would have compelled me to take two and a half years out of my life to write this book that I consider to be a primer on central banking that, is, that, that has been read worldwide and really pulls back the curtain and explains on a practical level how central banking uh, it impacts what you borrow, what you spend, how you save. Uh, but during the aftermath of the crisis, 2009, 2010, internally inside the Federal Reserve, it was recognized that they were using an inflation metric that was broken, that they were unable to see the rapid appreciation in, in residential real estate prices, that they didn't see the effect of, of asset price inflation in the stock market, in the corporate bond market, and the financial instability that that was introducing because their inflation gauge didn't capture that type of inflation. So it was decided after many white papers and debates and presentations and up to Washington DC and back, it was decided that the Fed needed to come up with a new inflation gauge. And then they decided to do nothing about it because it would have broken the models that they were using that give them license to this day to conduct quantitative easing and to maintain a looser monetary policy than what is merited by true inflation when it is holistic and captures every form of rising prices, including those of assets. Is it correct to assume that the central banks and the Fed, of course, is not alone here, uh, have been running economic instead of monetary policies. It is very correct to make that assumption. You know, I, I raised the point of, 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 of expanding that dual mandate in 1977. So, but what we've seen in a post pandemic era is that policymakers have again and again come to the podium and put out pleas to Congress and pleas to the administration. We need fiscal spending. We need fiscal spending. It is an implicit, it is an implicit admission of the fact 
that Federal Reserve policy has failed on its second mandate and its ability to bring down the unemployment rate without the federal government's becoming involved. And what that tells you is that maybe we should go back and unring that bell from 1977 and take that employment mandate away from the Fed such that it's the private sector and in times of recession, the fiscal authorities who come in with rescue packages for the unemployed. So I think that's a lesson that I hope that we've learned because the Fed has failed on the second mandate. And even as we discuss this, that's a pipe dream on my part because my opinion clearly doesn't count given the way that the, 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 the policymakers at the Fed and the fact that they don't allow dissent in the door. But my other concern is that the mandate's going to continue to be expanded. Uh, you know, they're talking about diversity within the Fed and I see no problem, I've, I'm a woman, I see no problem with diversity, but I'd like to see intellectual diversity before they talk about any other form of diversity. And then you get to talking about central bankers becoming involved in climate change, which is clearly something, I mean, maybe it's only clear to me, but it's clearly something in my humble opinion that should be the purview of the scientific community in conjunction with that of governments. Can you make an overview of the damage of such policies? Well, or it's a, already done, not the potential. <laughs> well, and, and, I, and I think that we have seen uh, what the damage has been inflicted because we have seen economic cycles drawn out for longer than they would have been otherwise by having the strong hand of Federal Reserve policy maintaining uh, looser uh, policies than there otherwise would be if the private markets, if the financial markets, if price discoverers were allowed to do their jobs and set rates and set prices of assets where they need to be. You can see it clearly in the overvaluation in the markets right now that leave economies so vulnerable, not to a big black swan shock, but rather to something very small that could tip them over into a situation where you see cascading asset prices that, that clearly trickle down. You, you, you can run into anybody on the streets of America and they'll tell you, I quit my job and bought Tesla and now I'm a millionaire. But assets are more overvalued than ever in the last 150 years, right? If you look back to the, the, the Schiller Cape PE ratio, price to earnings ratio and data back to 1881, uh, U.S. stocks right now are in the 99th percentile of valuations. The only prior parallels in history are 1929 and 1999. And again, this leaves the 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 the, the starting point of the current of, of the current cycle. It's very hard to argue that this is the we're at the advent of a secular bull market, because bull markets tend to be preceded by single digit. PEs on the world's benchmark index, the S&P 500. And just to give you a little bit of perspective, coming into this year, the, 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 the Schiller Cape price to earnings ratio was somewhere around 33.734. That is seven times the level that it was in 1920 coming out of a depression, seven times the magnitude. And it's, it's also four times the magnitude of what it was in 1982 when we were again, at the beginning of a very long run in risky asset prices. There's just no convincing me logically that can, can the melt up continue? Absolutely. Can anybody predict when a bubble's gonna get popped? No, but that does not say that this is illogical. It's illogical to purport that this is the beginning of a new long cycle. If you are an investor, uh, it, it's been difficult for a generation to invest in the stock market because of the transmission mechanism between quantitative easing and, and, and people seeking out higher yields and being forced into the stock market and forced into the corporate bond market. That's a dynamic that has been around for a very long time as retirees have not had enough in the way of gathering income based on their, their, their retirement savings by being safe. Uh, but in a post-pandemic world, what the Federal Reserve did uh, you know, actually, Mario Draghi really got the ball rolling with buying corporate bonds. We all remember when that when there was a, a a bond that was sitting on the ECB's balance sheet that was downgraded to debt, and there were accounting irregularities in the firm. And it was you say to yourself, they shouldn't have been holding a bond that was sub subject to being downgraded to junk in the first place. Uh, but then you've had the Bank of Japan and the Swiss National Bank, which is effectively a very large hedge fund. Uh, you've had them move into directly into the stock market. But on March the 23rd, 2020, the Federal Reserve changed the entire name of the game. 
So it came in and, and created a situation where there was no longer just no price discovery in the stock market, but they moved directly into the corporate bond market. And then on top of that, they, they took a, a housing market that had been slowing coming into 2020 because prices were so high. They took a residential real estate market that was beginning to cool off because prices needed to come down in order to benefit affordability and they 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 turbocharged it they went from a v6 to a v10 engine and now you have a disproportionate number of americans in this interest rate sensitive sector as jay powell likes to call it who've piled into housing at all-time high housing prices and they've benefited they've been able to take money out of their homes it's been an effective tax cut of $100 billion per quarter on a run rate in terms of cash out refinancing that American households are doing who have mortgages. But in the background, you have a household credit cycle that has not begun. You have 5% of American mortgages in forbearance, and that is probably going to be extended by the Biden administration. I don't know how I feel if I'm the banker holding that mortgage loan about the fact that somebody might be telling me instead of 12 months, you're not going to be able to collect a mortgage payment for 24 months, possibly. And you've also had all manner of distortions introduced because the Federal Reserve has been working with something that is completely foreign to Europeans, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac. These are these are companies that are that are that that, that back mortgages that are larger than the US treasury market, right? The US mortgage market is the largest bond market in the world. And they have also become involved in juicing up in a very compressed time chamber, a housing bubble by looking the other way and allowing for computer systems to do appraisals as opposed to individuals actually physically going into the homes and assessing what the value would be. So the last time they automated part of the underwriting process ended very badly with the subprime crisis. Then it was automated income approval. Now it's automated appraisals. But again, you have, you have in the background a very unnatural source of growth in a, in a critical market in addition to what the Fed has done with the corporate bond market. I hope that they're not able to simply replicate it because of some of the strictures that were laid out in the latest stimulus bill that said that the Fed cannot, cannot simply turn on and off the credit, the credit liquidity, liquidity facilities that were created in the aftermath of the pandemic. It has to be a different kind of an emergency. So I'm hoping that there is one small check and balance there to prevent uh, the Fed from just plowing back into post-coronavirus policies. What, what I do not understand is the fact that uh, central bank policies have not borne any fruit in terms of the full employment mandate, right? Mm -hmm. um, yet they just keep sticking to them, even though it, it is obvious they don't work. So why? Why is a very good question. And, you know, in 1977, uh, uh, I'll give you a little bit more history. In 1969, the unemployment rate in the United States, in the United States was 3.5%. And that was as low as it had gotten. That's why we kept saying, calling it a 50 year low because it had gotten to be as low as that by the, by the Federal Reserve trying to stick to its second mandate of, of, of maximizing employment by keeping interest rates so low for so long that they were building up this massive bubble in the credit markets and in the stock markets that they had to address immediately when there was a shock to the market. And that's what I continuously try and educate people about is it's not that it is not a noble aim to maximize employment. It is that you're using the wrong entity to deploy that because the Federal Reserve does not have the right tools to maximize employment. That is the purview of the private sector. And in times of recession, assistance on the fiscal side, which Jay Powell has effectively proven out in the past nine, 10 months, because he has continuously said, we cannot, he won't say it out loud, but he's inferred that they cannot deliver on their employment mandate because they continue to plea and plea and plea with Congress for fiscal relief in order to help the unemployed. If the Fed has demonstrated that it cannot deliver on its second mandate, then my vote would be for them to reopen the Federal Reserve Act 
and undo what they did in 1977 and say, you know what? This policy created a lot of risks for the economy and we're gonna reverse it and reduce your mandate back to simply minimizing inflation and call it a day. Richard Werner, um, the German economist, um, actually claims that the true success of any central bank is to avoid boom and bust cycles. <laughs> do you agree with him? I, I do not disagree at all. I respect his views tremendously. And it's the boom and bust cycle that is created because I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put my Austrian hat on here, uh, but it, it, there is something that is natural about a restructuring cycle. There is something that is natural about having recurrent recessions and not trying to prolong economic expansions for 10 or 11 or 12 years such that you get too much risk built up in the system and you do not get rid of the weakest, least efficient, least productive players that creative destruction allows for. But if you allow for that, you don't end up having discussions with people nonstop about, well, why, why are one in every, five US large companies considered to be zombies? Well, because interest rates were held too low for too long and we're in a boom and bust cycle that produces in, the, in their aftermaths zombie corporations that are a drag on economies over the long term. If we had obviously more recessions and nobody wants that, but if you had that- Smaller ones, yeah. Smaller ones, smaller, shallow, less deep. If you look at uh, 1991, if you look at 2001, these were small and shallow recessions in the United States that we came into and went out of. If you look at the, the depression of 1920, again, the central bank had nothing to do with it. It was the deepest deflation in US history, deflation. But the central bank did not step in too far and the economy came roaring back out of it. And then the central bank became a meddling function leading up to 1929. And then we had the Great Depression. So for me, if there's one thing that I would like to tell your readers and your listeners to do, it would be to go back and study the depression of 1920 in the United States and contrast that with the Great Depression and see the role that monetary policy played. If you get out of the way and allow the private sector to decide who the winners and the losers are, then you're going to have much less economic disruption over the long term. When markets are actually functioning properly at the moment, any market on uh, not on the brink of collapse? So I would say that of all the markets, uh, right now commercial real estate is certainly one area where you're getting more price discovery than not. And from listening to my friends in the trading pits, currencies continue to be a place where where traders can, can, can truly get price discovery. Commodities to not the same extent right now, because right now what you see on the ground in terms of commodity prices and what you see in the futures in the commodities markets are very disparate, very far apart, because you've seen speculators rush into a lot of these commodities. But right now, from what I hear from my traders, the FX market, the currency markets are one of the few places that are kind of clean, if you will. How long can uh, this, um policy blunder go on actually? You know, it's a very good question. Uh, we're about to put it to the test. Uh, and it's because we had the, Dem uh, the Democrats take those two Senate seats in Georgia that we're actually at the precipice of the first major test of the, the central bank confidence bubble that we've seen in a long time. We've been told that uh, universal basic income and beginning to, to conduct economic policy based on using the lever of, of income tax rates instead of inflation is going to be perfectly plausible because inflation is a figment of our collective imagination that will never return. You know, a lot of these modern monetary theorists who want to put this theory to the test and now they can, in theory, again, because of the blue sweep in the US government, they're right. 1981 was the last time that, that the world really had to worry about appreciably rising interest rates. It's the 40 year anniversary. But by the same token, if you want to really go down that path and instead of running two or three or $4 trillion deficits, if you just wanna pump it up to kingdom come, wait and see what happens because you're going to end up having We've already seen foreign participation in US treasury auctions falling off for years now. 
So there's clearly a pushing back in terms of the global economic, global central bank community to the amount of debt the US has taken on. But by uh, separately, if you consider where our fiscal authorities focus has been in recent years, and I like to, I like to put it in one sentence, soybeans, not semiconductors. Because of the different approach to fiscal finance that China has taken, which is a very difficult thing for me to concede to as a patriotic American, but because they've taken a different approach to how they spend their government dollars by encouraging the next generation of technology companies to rise by ensuring that they have top-notch infrastructure. Every study that I've seen, the Bank of International Settlements recently put out a paper that shows that, that China is going to become the largest economy in the world much more quickly because of the trade war colliding with the pandemic and its aftermath and the non-productive fiscal spending that is being done in the United States to counter the effects. So this is a very real situation that we have here where inflation, the inflation genie could be let out of her bottle and you could see an acceleration in rising prices alongside the continued outpacing of US economic growth on the part of China. Is that something that I want to see? No. Do I fear for my children and my potential grandchildren one day? Privacy? Yes, I do. And I think that there's a lot of consensus in the world. I think that there's finally a recognition in a post-COVID world, whether you're talking about Australia or England or Germany, whether you're talking about many countries who are saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, maybe we don't want China to have such a, such a huge influence and be able to become a monitor of the global populace. And yet, the United States has been focused on soybeans, They've been focused on semiconductors and the solution with the blue wave in the US government is to just spend our way into a welfare state. That won't work on the global stage. Let's say the tsunami of insolvencies starts to rise and roll. In what order uh, would, would the dominoes fall in your view? Well, the issue is that if, if you look at People don't understand that, you know, when, when I hear Jay Powell or Clarida or Lael Brainerd or any of the Fed officials say, it's, it's the Corona recession. I have to push back at the peak of the global financial crisis, non-financial debt. So that's just not corporate debt, corporate bonds, leverage loans, high yield bonds. But if you look at all loans across the banking sector and add that to corporate debt, so non-financial debt to US GDP at the peak of the global financial crisis was 74%. Coming into 2020, pre-COVID, it was a record 78%. So there was an accident waiting to happen in the corporate debt market and it happened. It happened when the shock occurred. And that's why Jay Powell had to come in and rescue the corporate debt market specifically. But how did he rescue it? By ensuring that two and a half, three trillion more dollars of debt was tacked onto this sector in order, that's a huge band-aid that he put on, but now we're looking at non-financial debt to GDP somewhere in the realm of 90%. So you've, you've resolved an overly indebted situation, challenge issue by tacking more debt on. So what could we see in terms of a lot of these zombie corporations that have been created there was a company a few days ago that had filed for what we call chapter 11 restructuring, re, uh, uh, bankruptcy, and it switched over to chapter seven bankruptcy uh, fi filing. That, that took it from a restructuring position to a liquidation pos position. Mm -hmm. And that's because again, if you bury the balance sheet in so much debt, if and when a small shock then happens upon this in insanely indebted company, there's very little in the way of, of value that can be recaptured in a reorganization restructuring process and you move on to liquidation, which is much more economically destructive. If you think about Delta Airlines or American Airlines, um, if you think about the way that they, that they monetize, that they securitize their mileage programs in order to put more debt on the balance sheet, that's just but one example. They're, they're, you know, they're gambling companies that have also taken on untold amounts of debt and again, as I said earlier, global travel 
is not going to return to what it once was. It's simply a fact of life. I'm, I'm at the podium often, but I've just had all of my spring conferences moved out to the fall. So there's a lot of business that is not being done in terms of conferences, travel around the world, eating, but it, 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 there's, there's a trickle down effect. And yet companies that are directly in these industries have been able to load up on debt. So you have to say to yourself, when the insolvencies come, they could be crushing because they won't be restructurings, they'll be liquidations. If you were um, the head of the US Fed, what would you do? Well, you know, if I was the head of the US Fed, I would have to be prepared to be a one and done Fed chair. So I, I would have to be prepared to get in and get out the door because I would, I would certainly suggest that that the, the zero interest rate bound is not realistic for the long-term health of the US financial system. I would, I, would not, I would not vouch for the Fed being intrusive in the corporate bond market or the stock market. And that would lead to a lot of upheaval that would help to clear away the zombie population, but there would be a lot of economic destruction there. And that is why there are so few people at the Fed and they don't wanna let any outside thinkers in as well. That is why they keep trying to kick the can down the road is that they're so focused on making sure that the, that the damage that they've created is never exposed. Mm -hmm. And so they have to keep going further and further down the Alice in Wonderland rabbit hole in order to try and, and keep papering that over. But there is such a long-term price to be paid. And again, from what we were just talking about, that, that price could be the loss of US, the United States being the, the world's superpower economically. Back to the US government, um, what do you expect from the Congress, Senate, and the White House in, in the short, mid, and long term? So I think that we're going to hear shortly uh, from them that there is there, there's going to be a push towards increasing the six hundred dollar uh, stimulus checks to closer to two thousand dollars. There are a few independents. There are there are, there are a few moderates in each party that are going to prohibit uh, any legislation of that kind from just being super easy to pass. Uh, there's going to be more of a focus on coming to the rescue, targeted rescues of small businesses. And I do hope that that is well thought out. And in addition to that, there's going to be more money that goes to helping uh, schools across the, con the country open, reopen safely because of the tremendous uh, the tremendous harm inflicted on women in the workforce as as a cause of the coronavirus who have not been who have, who've been forced to fall out of the workforce because their children are, are studying remotely and there's also going to be i think immediate money put towards uh the, the the dissemination of the vaccine and expediting that so that we can have greater confidence two-thirds of americans according to gallup are willing to take the vaccine that's 20 percentage points higher than France, I think. So, uh, so there's definitely a willingness here to try and achieve uh, nationwide va vaccine dissemination and in turn, hopefully open the economy to the extent that we can. So I, I am hoping that there is targeted fiscal spending and not just trying to increase from 600 to $2,000 checks for individuals or households. I, I, have, I have friends who both have good full-time jobs, great health benefits, but they together they don't make seventy more than seventy five thousand dollars. So their family just got a check for three thousand dollars. That she's like, I don't need it. So I'm going to learn how to day trade in the stock market. I'm like, this is great. But that's what happens when you have targeted uh, fiscal spending that goes into the wrong places in the economy. You end up having seven million retail brokerage accounts opened in the United States, as was the case in 2020, because that initial twelve hundred dollar stimulus check clearly went to people who didn't need it. Any tax reform expected? Well, we don't know. Uh, it, it's, it, it remains to be seen how aggressive uh, the Biden administration is going to be on the tax front because of the fragility of the, uh, of the economy right now. You could certainly see something along the lines of a capital gains tax. But as far mm -hmm. as whether or not corporate tax rates are going to be raised back to that 28% pre-Trump tax cut level. That is something that I think remains to be seen, be, again, because of the fragility of the economic recovery. But I could certainly see a quick imposition of higher capital gains taxes, which would translate its way into the markets, theoretically. The infrastructure bill, green bill. 
Well, those are two different things. Those are two different animals uh, in a big way. So um, I, I think that he will have to pick and choose. Unfortunately, the numbers surrounding potential infrastructure spending tend to be in the one to $2 trillion range. And I'm, I'm, I'm like, I'm very German in my ways. It's not that I'm trying to say, we need to put $7 trillion out there, but there's five plus trillion dollars of repairs that need to be done to infrastructure. And I would rather see, if we're going to have massive deficit spending, I would rather see it go to some place that has already been identified for years and years now. We're about to get a report on March the 3rd, 2021 of the, of the US report card for infrastructure. So we'll know even more here in just a matter of weeks uh, in, in terms of what needs to be done for infrastructure repairs. As far as the Green New Deal or the New Green Deal, I always say it incorrectly, which always gets me into trouble with everybody. Uh, you know, I, I see that as being given, again, the moderates in Congress, I don't necessarily see the ability to do any massive spending along those lines, along environmental lines, until you get past the initial triage of the fiscal spending that needs to be done in the immediate term to address uh, the aftermath of the pandemic and people who are unemployed, people who are at risk of losing their, uh, people at risk, who are at risk of being evicted from their rentals. Mm -hmm. Do you expect Federal uh, Reserve Act uh, uh, to get opened? There is a possibility. There is a possibility. Again, remember, Janet Yellen is on the record as saying under the right circumstances. So if there were to be the right circumstances, you certainly have the players in place. You have somebody who understands and is very, she was Jay Powell's mentor. So you, ha you have somebody who can work hand in hand, who is known to have the ability to cross the aisle. She speaks very softly. And the, the, the possibility of opening the Federal Reserve Act is, is higher under Janet Yellen than, than it has been under any of her predecessors because of the knowledge that she has and because of the fact that she's also aware, that, again, as a labor economist, if quantitative easing is policy that, not that they would ever admit it, is policy that only feeds through to the top one or 10% of Americans, then helicopter money sending money directly to people, well, that would really solve the problem. And that would get you past giving money to Wall Street if you gave it directly to Main Street, but it also happens to be against the law. So to do something along those lines, you would have to reopen the Federal Reserve Act. That opens you to a slippery slope of the potential for central bank digital currencies, because you're going to then get to the issue of how do we deliver the money? And then you get the banking lobbyist involved again, because it's a you basically negate the need for a depository banking system if you have if you have direct fed accounts anyways i just went off on a tangent the post keynesian economist uh steve keen would do as he calls it a, a modern debt jubilee with strings attached <laughs> do you see it as a feasible alternative to the present policies so when i think of debt jubilees i think of the bible and uh, when I think of the Bible, I don't think of, of the city. I don't think of Frankfurt and I don't think of Wall Street. So uh, we have a very complicated financial system. We have a very interconnected financial system. You've seen some of the, the, the most aggressive uh, growth in debt globally. I'm not talking about the United States in the non-financial debt sector. So when I think in terms of debt jubilees, the reason the, you know, the Bible comes to mind is because there weren't financial sectors back then. You just all hold hands, the United States and China included, and agree to expunge the debt. Of course. It, it works in theory and it works on paper, but when you consider how laser focused China is on attaining that reserve currency status, despite the fact that it's a communist regime. You just can't, I cannot picture China saying, sure, that, that's fine with us. We'll just let, we'll just clean the slate and with a few strings attached and call it a day. I would think that it would be, as has been the case for the past 400 years or so, an opportunity for the global reserve status to change hands. In terms of uh, global ramifications of the present policies, I know this is a huge topic, the US dollar um, and losing uh, it as the global base currency. Um, 
Can we be, be uh, brief on that? In um, I will say that the coronavirus has been a game changer for the future of the US dollar, but not because of why we think. A, a lot of countries in the world are beholden to China. But when the IMF is in charge of 74, 80, I can't even keep count of the number of countries that are being bailed out right now. But when the IMF is that busy, it's not as if China can knock on the door and say, you know, you owe us money right now. It just doesn't look good on the world stage, especially when they're possibly, you know, let a global pandemic run around for a few months and didn't mention something about it. So, but that doesn't mean that China doesn't have leverage with the countries that are, that, that owe it. Yeah. And I, I bring this up because you did ask an enormous question, <laughs> but yeah. I bring this up to say that if you can't have a debtor creditor relationship, maybe you can still be indebted. And when, again, I'm a believer that global reserve currency status changes with some semblance of conflict, or at least it has historically, it certainly matters who your allies are in the world when that moment comes and, and other countries have to decide whose side they're on. And what if it's the case that because China has quietly colonized as they have over the past decade or so plus, what if it's the case that companies, that, that countries are beholden to China and aren't able to side with a more peaceful potential outcome? What if they're beholden? And so that is what I would add to the pure economic discussion of the debt that, you know, that the United States has put on, the risk it poses to the dollar, the profligacy of the US government, the hubris in thinking that there's always going to be an audience at our treasury auctions. In addition to that, you have to look at this in a global manner and understand who owes whom. On one hand, we have exogenous deflationary trends pandemic, technology, demographics. At the same time, inflationary policies, when do you expect the first to morph into the latter? Back at 1969, in that period of three and a half percent unemployment rate, which is extraordinary in US history, to where the Federal Reserve was given its second mandate, 1977, the unemployment rate back then was very similar to where it is today. And we had similar disinflationary pressures. We had similar sclerotic growth and yet inflation rose, but it wasn't called, the conflict you're describing is not called inflation or deflation, it's called stagflation. And that is uh, uh, to me a, a, a real time threat because I cannot envision the output gap closing rapidly. There is a lot of economic scarring to the global workforce. There's long-term unemployment uh, that is going to take years and years to correct for. So the disinflationary pressures will continue. The last time we had a global financial crisis, we were talking about baby boomers who were going into their 60s and 70s. Now they're going into their 70s and 80s. So demographics is very much more real in terms of people needing to take their money out of the market, the potential for asset price deflation. And the coronavirus has expedited on every level the push towards automation because there has been a push against, you know, the, the need for human contact type of employment. So that's expedited a trend that was already accelerating. So those disinflationary pressures and the, the, the ability to close that output gap are not going to be rectified anytime soon, but by the same token, you know, you're gonna have the fiscal authorities globally. This printing money business is, it's a competitive sport at this point. So you will have the potential, I think, for stagflation more than runaway inflation. So that's not to say, I mean, to me, stagflation marries together the two, the two pressures. Any advice to the ord ordinary folks where to hide, uh, not to get their livelihood eroded? It's very difficult to, to raise up your hands and say, go into hard assets because if there's one thing that central bank policy has accomplished globally, if you look at Norway, if you look at Canada, if you look at Australia, if you look at Germany, so many countries have residential real estate 
bubbles because and, and commercial real estate over development because there have been so few places to find yield when interest rates have been held at artificially low levels. So you would normally say pile into those hard assets of real estate, but at this point, you know, I would be very conservative in terms of holding more cash than you would otherwise, and I would be very aggressive in terms of precious metals. Gold versus Bitcoin uh, or both? Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, a lot of people like to say both to cover themselves, but I'm yeah. not going to pretend to understand something that moves in a parabolic fashion, regardless of the theories and the the idea behind it and the future of uh, of, of the backlash against fiat currencies. I understand the theory of Bitcoin. I don't understand how it's behaved. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to find anybody who could say they have. A gentleman who suggested that Bitcoin was going to 400,000 just recently said, or it might've moved a little too fast. So again, when things move in parabolic fashion, kind of like the, the I mean, the, the two poster children, when we look back one day and we will look back, will be Tesla, and Bitcoin. Danielle, uh, thanks so much for this great talk. Uh, hope we can do this again sometime in the future. Where can our audience continue to follow you? So uh, please come to quillintelligence.com. Uh, we, we have many overseas uh, subscribers and they enjoy our research. And uh, I've been told that I tweet 24 hours a day. I hope that's not the case, but if you're not following me on I've Twitter tweeted. already, <laughs> I, I tweet at all hours, but follow me at Demartino Booth. And I would always love and, and welcome your commentary. I hope you continue to enjoy your day. Thank you, you too. Um, I should say good night to you. Yes. Yeah, thank you so much. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye-bye, take care. Mm -hmm.